Hey, when we last left off, we were looking at this setup. We can see we have our processor. It's listed over here under PLC one, and we can see it in our view here. Um, we compiled and downloaded the software that we're looking at right now, which is just blank because it's we did we opened a new project. We didn't write any software yet, so we put the blank the copy of blank project inside the processor, and then we matched everything matched so we could go online and everything. The orange lights up here, meaning we're online and everything's green here, which means everything matches and we all check out. So when that's the case, when you look at your logic, you can hit those little glasses up here that I can't show now until we have logic in there. And then you can actually see the mm -hmm. status of all your IO in real time. Um, but as of right now, we're online, we're going to go offline and we're going to write a couple. We're going to add a new block. So under program, under the your PLC, go down to program blocks, expand that. I'm going to add a new block. It's going to be a double click. Mm -hmm. Do we want an OB, a function block, or a function, or just a data block? Uh, if you select these individually, you can. Uh, it'll give you a description of what they are. So this is for my block. I'm gonna call it. Um, I will call it stop start. And I don't know if I can use slashes. I'll just make a normal stop start circuit. Um, now, if I go to function block, it says function blocks are code blocks that store their values permanently in an instance data block. So if you have a timer or a counter or something that needs to keep track in between scans of the of the, your logic, if it needs to keep like a, a running total or something like that, or accumulated value, uh, something along those lines, then you're gonna need to use a function block so it has a data block with it. So the data block is gonna be a location in memory that can save information. Um, if you have a function, functions are code blocks or subroutines without dedicated memory. So if I do this function, um, for now, function will work. So if you can get away with something without using memory, um, if you can write your logic in such a way that you don't need to retain information in between scans, you can use a function and that's the way you should go. Uh, up here, you select your language, uh, function block diagram, SCL, or ladder. We're going to be ladder. 99% of the time, we're going to be ladder. So that's what it's going to be called. We're going to use a function. It's going to be louder. OK. Now you'll see over here in a minute, <laughs> we have our stop start FC1. So that's our first function. And you can see at the top here, it says stop start FC1. And the reason I'm pointing it out that it's up here, these are called breadcrumbs. Um, so the project's called video one. I'm in processor one right here. And then you dig down the next level. I'm in program blocks. And then in program blocks, I'm in the stop start function right here. So you can tell where you're at at any given time. The reason I'm pointing that out is if you go to OB1, OB1 is identical at this point. So you don't know <laughs> all the inside stuff in here looks exactly the same as function. I guess right here it says main program sweep cycle. But other than that, it's hard to tell because you don't have any logic yet. So you want to make, so people often will, when they first start out, they'll go to OB1 and they'll start dragging instructions down into network one of OB1. And that is not the standard way to do it in here. OB1 is an organizational block. So you shouldn't have um, all your logic in the organizational block. It's kind of like the block that calls the subroutines. So your functions, um, your function blocks and your functions are the ones that are actually contain all the logic and all the processes. Um, the organizational blocks just kind of call them in the right order. If that makes sense. Um, so I'll show you what I mean here in a second. So we'll go into our stop start and I, so here's your most commonly used instructions. And then over here on the side, we're on the instructions tab. And here is like your bit logic operations. So here's some of the same ones that you see over there, except more of them. And then you can go down to like timer operations. You see time on delay, time off delay all that. Here's your counters, math functions. So anything that you want to use that's not one of the really common ones that's right up here, they're going to be right next to your own instructions. So you could be on one of these other tabs and you won't see it over here. So it's the very top of instructions right there. Um, most of the stuff you're going to want to do is going to be here though. So the way I like to do it is make all my tags. This is tag based um, as opposed to like bit based, like the RSLogix 500 we looked at before. So I like to make my tags first, and then you, when you drag your instructions on, you can, it'll just be a pull down list to associate that instruction with an already made tag. So if you go to PLC tags, 
Um, I like to go to show all tags and right here you can make it. So I'll hit the stop. Um, I'm just going to write them all out first then I'll go back and change them. Start and then just call the motor. So it's going to just be a stop start for motor. Uh, my stop is going to be input zero zero. That sounds right. Um, my start is going to be input zero one. Also sounds good. My motor is going to be an output. So the, ignore this percent symbol here. Um, it's I 0.0. .0 so it's input byte zero bit zero. Um, we want to go to this one though and change it from an input. Click it too many times. Here's your identifier. So you can make it an input, an output, or a memory bit. The queues are outputs on Siemens. So I select Q and it's address zero bit two because it just kept counting down, but we want it bit zero. I might have misspoke though. The, this address, the first number, I'd have to, I have to double check in the book if that. So in um, RSLOG 500, it's a byte and then this is the bit in that byte. I'm not 100% sure. It might be a bigger, it might be 16 bit. I got to double check on that one. So it didn't take me 100% on that. <laughs> um, address zero, bit zero, and it's an output. So hit okay. So now we have two inputs and an output set up over here. Data type is bool, meaning it's uh, a short for boolean, meaning it's a true or a false, or a one or a zero. Um, and it's in your default tag table. So you can have multiple different tag tables that have different information in different tables. I usually keep everything, it's a small program, keep everything in the default tag table. So we have three tags, start, stop, and motor. And we're gonna use these tags in our logic, in our start, uh, stop, start function, function one. So I'm gonna drag down a normally open, I'm assuming the push button has normally closed the contacts on it for the start. And I will drag this over here. Um, and then my output. And I'm going to draw. So to make a rung in RSLogic 500, you could, you could drag that whole like rung around. It doesn't really work that way here. You have to drag this here. And then it looks like a weird side voice Christmas tree thing. And you're like, what, what does that mean? What do I do now? Now you have to drag your inst other instruction down there like that. And then you have to have an up arrow that goes right back up. So that's how you get your rung around there. And generally I like to put my stop button to the left of my latch or my seal, but it's easier in Siemens if you do it this way, it's just more convenient. So this, because this is in the series section of the circuit, then I'm gonna make uh, this the stop button. So all you have to do here is double click on that. And now you have a little list and I can pick my stop button because I already wrote out the tag for it and it brings over my input 0, 0.0. And I can do the same here. Go with the start button, and I can do the same here and just select my output because I already made all my tags. For me, that's easier. You don't have to do it that way. You can make your logic first and you can address these all on the fly inside your logic. But I like to plan out my program first and go into my tags, write out all my tags, and then it's quick just to select everything as you go through. Um, here's another thing uh, in a lot of Alan Bradley software, you can select this and drag it down to copy it. Now it's doing all kinds of weird stuff. You can select this and drag it down to copy it, the address down to that guy. Um, I won't even let me drag it at all now, but what happens if when it does let you drag it is it takes it off of this instruction and moves it here. It doesn't copy it. Um, so it's easier just to pull it down and pick it again from here. You can pick the motor there. Now it's the same. It's the same as dragging it. You're just selecting it from the list. Uh, but in Siemens, if you drag it, it takes it off of this instruction and moves it to that one instead of making a copy of it. Um, so right now we should have our start. And I'm assuming these it's going to be normally open contacts on the physical start button and normally closed contacts on the physical stop. That's why I left this as a normally open. And you'd energize that. You'd hit your input for input 0 0.1. It would hit start. This would be closed. Uh, because you have normally closed contacts on your physical stop button, it will go through and energize your motor. When your motor energizes, it would close this, bypassing your start button. So when you let go of your start button, it seals or latches on. Um, now, it won't let us go online until it matches because now we have different logic on our screen than what is in the processor. Uh, before we get that to that though, do you remember the OB1? the one that was blank before and matched our function. 
OB1 is the only thing that's called when a processor turns on. So even though we have this logic in here in the function one, if we download our per, it'll let you download the program as it is now to the processor and it won't give you any kind of um, faults or warnings. And then when you put the processor in rough mode, you're gonna wonder why this isn't working. <laughs> It's because the processor goes to OB1 and decides what to run based on what's in OB1. What we have in OB1 is nothing. So it's not going to go to function one and execute it. It's going to go to be OB1 and see there's nothing there and nothing's going to happen. Um, you're going to do this hundred percent. You're going to do this. You're going to add another function and you're going to forget to add that second function into OB1. Um, or you're going to edit, you know, it's going to happen that you're going to forget to up update OB1. And OB1 is what actually is running when the processor starts up. So the way we do it is we open OB1, which is blank now, and we click on our start, stop start function one, and we drag it over and drop it on OB1. You'll notice it looks different. It doesn't look like regular logic. It's saying start FC1, um, which is function one. So now when the processor starts, it'll go to OB1. It'll see this. This tells it run subprocess function one, which is down here because function one and it executes our logic. And then that's the only thing in there. So it goes back to OB1 to see what it should run next. And there isn't anything. So it starts over running FC1 again. Um, so it's a little bit different organization. It's like ladder in ours logics 500. It's like ladder two is the main ladder and you can put everything in there if you want, or you can call subroutines from there. And then it's like ladder three, ladder four, ladder five that you can rename and call those as subroutines. It's not that way here. So you have OB ones are calling subroutines, which are function blocks or functions. Um, and you can make more, um, you can make OB two, OB three, whatever. You can make more organizational blocks if you want to, but this is how it's set up by default. So now we want to go to PLC one and right click on it and go to compile. So now it gives me options for hardware and software. You remember I said you could change your hardware configuration and it had to match what was in the processor. So I am going to go hardware, rebuild all. And I'm going to go software, rebuild all, just to make sure it gets everything. And down here it says block was, block was successfully compiled. That's the start stop function one block. And then it says OB1 was successfully compiled and it has to compile it now because now it calls that function. So there is data in that block now that needs to be compiled to machine code before it gets loaded into the PLC. It says finished compiling, error zero, warnings zero. That's what we want. And now we are going to go online with it, hopefully. Click up here and go online. And you'll see it went online immediately. This time it didn't ask us to configure our it didn't search for the processor or worry about configuring or anything like that. Let's see what all these issues are over here. Oh, you know what? I compiled it and I didn't download it. So I'm going to go back offline. So you have to compile hardware, compile software, and then download to the device. So I compiled them, but then I never sent the compiled version into the processor. So hardware and software only changes. That sounds good. And now I will load. So it says the hardware configuration has not been loaded because it's up to date because our hardware configuration didn't change. It's just that one processor, same model, same that, same uh, firmware revision. It did download the software though. So hit finish. Now, if we go online, everything's green because what we're looking at and what's in the processor is the same. So if you want to look at what's going on with your logic, you go into your logic you want to see, and these are the little glasses that I was talking about. This is monitoring on and off. You click that, and it shows you in highlighted in green what is true, because technically you're evaluating the left side of the rung, all the inputs, and to see if this evaluates as true or false. And if it's true, it updates the output to true. If it's false, it updates to false. So the highlighted green part. Now, if I were to press the start button, it would highlight the green up until here and down there. And if this whole rung was true and it was energizing the motor, it would all be highlighted in green um, all the way over, which is nicer than the old Allen Bradley stuff that just kind of highlights above it in yellow, yellowish greenish color. It'll highlight, you can see the whole path of where, uh, I don't want to say current flow because it's not technically current flow, but um, you get the idea. If it was relay logic, it would be the current flow, but 
you can see where exactly what instruction is keeping the path from getting to the output and energizing the output um, instead of just a little highlighted block above it. So we are online because we see orange. Uh, everything's green, which means what we're looking at matches what's in the processor. And we're in real time watching the inputs um, here. But as a review, what we looked at here was when we started this video, we had our processor added in the project and we were able to go online because we connected with it. Um, now what we added was FC1 with logic in it. And then we added the call to FC1 in OB1 which is this. Uh, and then we compiled and downloaded our hardware, and then we went back online. And then the way that we can see this FC1 in real time is to click this monitoring up here, monitoring one off. Uh, do I want to go offline? Sure. Now I'm offline. All my indicators of whether we match or not are gone, and it's not orange at the top anymore, so I'm back offline.